Professor John Hernshaw has spent his working life embracing the passionate scientific beauty of astronomy. Thousands of tireless hours have been rewardingly sacrificed to the beast we call the universe. Today we meet this terribly modest chap whose life's works can be captured within the famous lyrics of a Jane Taylor song. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I like that nursery rhyme. It's, it's really relevant to what astronomers are doing. We're trying to find out um, what stars are made of and how they form, how they change during their lives. So that's one of the things astronomers are doing, not, not the only thing, but uh, stars are still very important in astronomy. So let's get back to basics. What can this accomplished University of Canterbury lecturer tell us about astronomy? Well, astronomy is, first of all, it's the study of stars, obviously, and um, there are lots of stars in the universe, so astronomers study them. But now we know there are many other types of objects in the universe. For example, there are galaxies, which are huge assemblages containing billions of stars. And we live in one of those, the Milky Way galaxy. In addition to that, there are things called quasars, which are massive black holes with matter falling into them, pulsars, there are planets in our solar system coming closer to home. And then, uh, in addition to stars, there's the material between the stars. Space isn't empty. It's full of gas and tiny little dust particles, the interstellar medium, we call it. So astronomers have a huge range of objects to look at these days. And we don't just use uh, visible light to observe the universe. That's the light we can see with our eyes. But today we're using radio waves, X-rays, ultraviolet light, infrared or heat radiation, even gamma rays we can use to observe the universe. After three books, 87 refereed papers in scientific journals, 15 chapters in books or books edited, and much, much more, John takes time to reflect on how this impressive career was launched. Well, I grew up in Britain. I might say I was born in New Zealand, grew up in Britain, and I went to university uh, in England. And after my first degree, I wondered what shall I do next? So I wanted to do a PhD. And astronomy just seemed like a neat subject. And my mother was an Aussie, my father was English. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to go to Australia and, and uh, see the country my mother came from? And astronomy provided that opportunity. So I actually did a doctorate in Canberra, in Australia, in the 1960s, early 70s. So that was my introduction to astronomy. And I'm sure it was the motivation of seeing Australia and my mother's country that uh, made me decide to go down that route. So it's a decision I've never regretted because Australia is a fantastic place. So I have allegiance, as you can see, to Britain, Australia and New Zealand, mainly to New Zealand now, but, uh, but my parents were living in New Zealand um, throughout the war years and so uh, I had a lot of friends in New Zealand, so it was, it was, I was very fortunate to get a job at the University of Canterbury. Um, sometime after my PhD. After my PhD I had several years in France and Paris which was a, another fantastic experience uh, so I do love um, Paris particularly. And then I went to Massachusetts, Harvard University for a couple of years before coming back to New Zealand in 1976 so I've actually been at the University of Canterbury <laughs> rather a long time now, 34 years which is probably too long but the fact that I've stayed all that time means uh, it's been a good life. One thing we always try to do in the sky at night is to take complicated subjects and explain them in terms anyone can understand. Quasars, pulsars and so on. I hope we succeeded. Well, the tides, as you know, are due to the influence of the sun and the moon. And when they pull together, as they're doing at the present moment, uh, the pull is added, you see, and we get high tides. Granted that the forces are enormous, just how big are they? It's absolutely tremendous. There's no doubt at all of it. Of course, the tides the biggest natural force in the entire world. And this is a Most of us have role models in our chosen paths. For John, he chose a colourful astronomer turned television presenter, who is credited as having done more than any other to raise the profile of astronomy among the British general public. Yeah, I've, I guess I became interested in astronomy when I was a teenager, and Patrick Moore was doing his... I, I grew up in Britain, 
and he was doing his show, uh, The Sky at Night. I think he still is, actually. <laughs> and uh, he wrote a lot of popular books, which I, I read some of them. So he was certainly one of my role models for getting into astronomy uh, in my early, early years. So. And he's, Patrick's been out to New Zealand uh, two or three times, and he's a good friend of mine. He's uh, come home, and we've entertained him at home, so uh, I enjoy Patrick a lot. From one strong character towering in the world of astronomy to the spectacular Mount John Observatory, towering over the picturesque splendour of Lake Tikapo. We built this telescope, which you can see behind me, uh, in the early 1980s. We started building it in 1980, and it took about five years to design and build, all done at the University of Canterbury. And I was the, uh, what we call the PI, or principal investigator for that project. It twinkles at night and offers a grand window into our galaxy, but can the seemingly infinite reaches of the heavens above Lake Tikapo become a recognised heritage site? My friend Graham Murray from Earth and Sky, he's the director of Earth and Sky, came up with this idea that Tikapo should be declared a starlight reserve and the World Heritage Committee which is inside UNESCO have these World Heritage Sites and they've just become interested in astronomy and astronomical sites so we've, we have this idea that perhaps Tekapo could become a World Heritage Starlight Reserve. Now the World Heritage Committee uh, has been thinking about this, I'm not quite sure if they're going to run with it but Tekapo could well be one of the first uh, starlight reserves in the world. And it just means it's a place where the lighting is protected so we don't have unnecessary light pollution, which of course prevents people having such a good view of the stars. The International Astronomical Union was founded in 1919. It has over 10,000 members and John proudly is the chairman. The International Astronomical Union is a worldwide body of professional astronomer, astr astronomers and they have this committee which I chair for promoting astronomy in developing countries. So, um, I have a committee of a dozen or so uh, people around the world, but I do a, the lion's share of the travelling. And the last few years, well, I've been to Mongolia, Cuba, Uzbekistan, Mauritius, Paraguay, Laos, Vietnam, <laughs> lots of interesting places where Perhaps normally I wouldn't have gone. And the other nice thing, I meet uh, astronomer friends uh, in all these countries, so I've got friends all over the world, and that's also a wonderful experience. So it's very rewarding work. So every year I perhaps do a couple of trips lasting a week or two and um, go to these fantastic places. In and around trying to discover another little thing called Earth, is there time for more conventional activities? So I wish I had more time for them, but uh, I love listening to music for one, and uh, so I used to play the oboe in an orchestra, so I like wind music and classical music, symphonies, uh, things like that. And another thing I enjoy doing, and which I've done ever since my student days, is playing croquet. The hard-hitting mallet on the croquet lawn could not be confused with the shockingly hard hits that can be witnessed in our magnificent universe. Some people might be shocked to learn that, for example, we rely on the sun for uh, light and heat, but the sun is going to run out of energy uh, sooner or later in about five billion years. So you may be shocked to learn that life on Earth will not last forever, I'm afraid. And with all this explosive activity in our universe, can there be life outside Earth? Well, I think all astronomers uh, are led to believe that nothing here on Earth is unique and that there are lots of planets uh, orbiting other stars. Probably some are like the Earth and therefore probably uh, they also have life. So I certainly think that there's every prospect that life exists elsewhere. Whether it's intelligent life uh, is another matter, but probably it's, most of it's quite primitive life. But I think one of the most um, active areas of research in astronomy today is to find planets like the Earth. And that's an incredibly difficult task right at the cutting edge of modern technology. 
but it's just within our grasp. And one of the programs I'm doing here at Mount John is to try and find planets like our Earth orbiting our nearest star, which is called Alpha Centauri. So I'm running a program uh, doing that research, and we think that in a couple of years we could find evidence for such a planet. Astronomy has been called the sexy science, but why does this particular scientific study arouse the public's curiosity? Astronomy is very romantic and we're very lucky. We've got something that people actually want to see and they enthuse about. So uh, public um, education in astronomy is, uh, is very popular and it's a very easy sort of subject to put across because it's a very visual subject, lots of beautiful things to see in the sky and visitors here can do some of that observing themselves. They can look through small telescopes and see the beauty of the universe.